Okay, street talk time then. Um, if you're listening to this on YouTube, uh, which where we kind of cut off the beginning of the podcast for you, you we would have missed Gemma saying that this is going to be our fastest ever street talk. But I don't know whether you've forgotten at the time, Gemma, that when at the beginning of the podcast, the street talks used to be what ten minutes long or so. I don't think we're going to quite manage to. Well, I didn't get it. You, you said this was going to be our fastest street talk ever because we're all hot and sweaty yeah, and but, echoey in our Manchester yeah, apartment. But, and... but back in the early days, street oh, yeah. talk was like 10 minutes long and I can't, I don't think we're going to manage less than 10 minutes street talk. But oh, I'm sorry. Still, I still reckon it. it's going to be, you know, an hour Falsely or so. Advertised. It was, it was. Anyway, so this week we've got, um, we've got the Yasmin story first. Though we didn't see any Yasmin again at all this week. So I was trying to come up with a good storyline title that referred to Elaine this week, I Gemma. I think this is why it takes so long. Yeah, it doesn't matter. This is the most important part. Yeah. So okay. possible storyline titles, Elaine in state. Because she was in a state this week and it sounds like Elaine in state. Yeah, you get like it? Mum. Also, a run down Mama Elaine. Yeah, because get she's looking out. really run down at the moment and she's Mama Elaine. Get run out. Run down Mama Elaine. Get out, of the, get out of this house. Then we got the watch out storyline, which wasn't much about a watch this week, but you know, Gary, Sarah, Adam, that's done the stuff there. We had a little bit of Never the Twins Shall Meet came back this week. <laughs> and no, it's not that. And then um, we had a bit more of a serious case of the Ollie Wobbles, a few scenes with Leanne and Toya and Mandy. Remember did Mandy from Auntie Nature Class? No, neither do we. Did you say you were starting off? I am going to do the Elaine storyline this week. And it was all about um, Jeff's lies unravelling, basically, wasn't it? And him, like all good Corey villains, being able to come up with, you know, tangible reasons for why he said such and tangible? such. Tangible? At a drop of a hat. Is that the wrong word? It probably tangible is. Tangible means like you can, it exists. Okay, believable reasons about why he lied to the police or whatever. At a drop of a hat, but it, it, it's, it, the, the walls are closing on on him, apparently. Good. So, um, Elaine's only in Monday's episode. She does a bit of a disappearing she's dead. act at the end of it. So she's um, there in the cafe with Elaine at the beginning, uh, with Sally, sorry, at the beginning. And Sally's sort of saying, like, is this what you're saying? Is, is this true? You're not a mad old liar, are you, Elaine? And she says, Look, I've got no reason to lie about this. Why, I'm not a why on earth would I lie? Why would I pretend to be Tim's mum? Why would you take credit for that? <laughs> yeah, why would I? So she says, Look, I've, I've lost everything thanks to Jeff, and I'm terrified of speaking to him. Um, I don't want to, I've, I've been scared of contacting Tim all these years. She feels guilty about abandoning him. What, she tried to forget about it, but this has brought it all back. A great way to really test whether Elaine is actually Tim's mum is to say, did you know you le- never learned to read? And if she's like, what? How, oh, I can't believe a son of mine doesn't know how to read. If she's like outraged and annoyed. Then she's probably is. She probably is. But if she's like, yeah, he looks like the sort of person who's <laughs> That has all been forgotten about, I think. Anyway. Well, I maintain what you said was correct, that Tim doesn't know who his mum is because he's never read his birth certificate. Oh, I really want somebody to mention the birth certificate. I was waiting. I was thinking, when he was speaking with Jeff in tonight's episode, saying, you're not lying, are you, Dad? You haven't been lying to me all this, this time. That would be the perfect opportunity to, for him to say birth certificate. Or when Sally was so completely convinced that Jeff was you know, making all this up. I thought she might say, let's see the birth certificate then. I know. Or Faye maybe, let's On see the birth Facebook certificate. On the group, they're a bit crazy about the fact that they've not mentioned the birth certificate. But it's interesting because what, apart from getting married in Las Vegas, once you've got your passport and your driving licence, I don't think you really need it. Mm. Well, I mean, it seems like it's something that should get mentioned, and I would have thought that Coronation yeah. Street would no, have I'm thought not, that people would be asking about it. So. To, I'm not saying people are wrong. I'm just trying to think of a plausible deniability mm. reason why Coronation Street can get away with saying that he never looked at his birth certificate. Mm. Anyway, Sally says, look, just go and speak to Tim again. Please try and convince him, because I believe you, but he still doesn't. But I think if you just have a little bit of a word with him, you might, be, you might come over to your side. Unfortunately for Elaine, she's not able to get to Tim because Jeff comes up next to her in his car and says, long time no see, Philippa. <gasps> now, we have a bit of a good Samaritan situation on this scene because while poor Erica slash Philippa is being menaced in the ginnel by Jeff, we have two people walk past and go, oh, that looks a bit odd. She looks tell you what, at a woman being backed into a ginnel by dodgy Jeff. What? I am intrigued and I want people to write in and tell me what they think. What the hell is Rita doing with rice wine vinegar? Answers on the back of the What was the card. story there? 
Jen. Well, Jenny gone to go and get her some, and there wasn't any, and so she said something like, "She's normal wine." Just and get vinegar. rice wine and put vinegar in it. <laughs> which, like sorry, that. sorry, um, Jenny doesn't work. I thought well. she just said get rice and stick in wine and vinegar. I'm sure Rita's got plenty of uh, plenty of wine at least. Yeah, if you don't have any rice wine vinegar, oh, she's a gin woman. You really can just substitute white wine vinegar or cider vinegar. And if you don't have either of those, just throw yourself in the dustbin. Oh, Rita knows who to ring up now, <laughs> next time she wants some cooking advice. <laughs> so anyway, first in our Good Samaritans um, uh, scenario, we have Jenny walking past. She's got her iPod, her AirPods in, hasn't she? Oh, Let's she was see. having a great time being a high fluent executive, but only ever speaking to Rita on the phone. <laughs> um, so she, she kind of has a look at Jeff menacing... Um, uh, Elaine and uh, Elaine slash Oliver in the ginnel and just carries Oliver over to the Rovers. She's got more important things to be getting She's on with. She's got stuff to do. And later on, uh, Faye does as well, doesn't she? I can't remember. Yeah, Faye comes along later. Uh, meanwhile, Jeff is saying, is telling her that you need to bugger off. And she says, well, we'll see what the courts have got to say when, we, when they find out what you're really like. And he says, look, you're not Tim's mum. You gave on that gave up on that when you abandoned him. So he confirms to us, the audience, that yes, this is definitely, definitely true, and he knows it's true. This is what Faye's um, watching in on. I don't know what on earth she thought that she saw there. I mean, she, said, she says later, doesn't she, when they go back home, oh, I saw him speaking to somebody. I think that was on Wednesday. I saw him speaking to someone, but... I don't know, would you, would you go over? Maybe like, find what's, you wouldn't go over. what's going on there? You wouldn't go over because... The certain there's a certain air of authority that patriarchs confer in the family, don't they? And I think that Jeff is certainly an intimidating person. He is, but I mean, I don't think you'd think Faye's that... a bit of a, a feisty one. You'd, I would have thought that maybe she would have imagined Elaine was, you know, having a go at him, and she'd want to go over there and protect her granddad, who she knows the whole world is against at the moment. But anyway, we, maybe, we'll never know, will we? May, maybe. What do teenage girls like getting back to? She's got to go back to reorganise her Backstreet Boys cassettes. That's that's exactly it. Did Backstreet Boys come out on cassette? Yes. Probably not. Anyway, Sally comes into the Rovers later for hot pots and teams. wine. Ali is there too, and and Ryan. Tell Ali, what, it turns it turns what? When sorry, it's all right. When when Sally came in to buy a hot pot and wine, I thought that sounds great. That's that's all we're having for dinner. Yeah. So um. Turns out, Ali tells Ryan that she's not been able to make any contact with Elaine today. Mm, how weird. And Jenny says, what does this Elaine look like exactly? And when she hears she the description... She like a frightened rabbit woman. Yeah, exactly that. Oh, I saw a frightened rabbit woman in her <laughs> warren around the side of the pub earlier. <laughs> yeah. I, I saw her having a, an argument with, with, with Jeff. It didn't look friendly, but, you know, I don't want to say anything. Do you want to say anything about the, the, the coercive control of domestic abuser menacing a small lady? Yeah. It wasn't Yasmin, so I thought, none of my business. Can't be asked for this. Anyway, end of the episode, we have Jeff pulling up back on the street in his car. He's taking a lane, it looks like, on a nice little trip somewhere. And poor woman's left, lost her phone. So he's going to store it, well, just the SIM card for safekeeping, yeah, yeah. down in the drain in the middle of the street. <laughs> mm. I love the way he did this. Took her phone, took the SIM card out. And just got rid of it. And that's the last we see of Elaine this Sinister. week. Sinister. So Wednesday, Sally starts off in, in a bit of a pensive mood. She's trying to figure out... Well, she, she, she knows really, doesn't she? There, there's not a whole lot more thinking that needs to be done there. She knows exactly what's been going on here. It's just how can I convince Tim to believe me? Well, don't marry they an have idiot. A, they have an argument over Elaine again, basically. Alia, meanwhile, is trying to phone up Elaine, still not getting any response. It's saying it's out of service. Then we have a weird scene with Ryan, and I, I think I know why he was doing this, but he was phoning up streetcars, wasn't he? Putting on a dodgy Irish accent that sounds like he's got off his granddad Barry to say if Tim's there, and straight away Tim's like, is that you, Ryan? I thought this <laughs> was... Stumbles to, to hang up as quickly as he can. I thought this was a tribute to Jude. <laughs> why? Because it's played by Paddy McGinn... No, who's it played by? Not Paddy McGinn, it's Paddy Wallace. Oh, Paddy Wallace, who's as Irish as you can be. Yes. And um, he also was a massive a liar, notorious liar. The yeah. the character, not the actor. <laughs> <laughs> Although he does lie for a living, so that's all acting, isn't it? Yeah. I, I believe that he was just trying to find out whether Tim was at streetcars, so that yes. Alia could go around Sally's house to try and you know put their heads together or right, something. Have you got any cars going to places that I need to get to? Like down to the Brook Bagara. Tipperary. I hear it's a long way there. You go that far. 
<laughs> so but Sally goes around to no, Alia goes around to Sally. Sorry, and they they say right, let's get to the police station. So they go over give DS Abney a total exposition dump on everything that's been going on recently. And she's, she, I still think that she suspects Jeff because he's been... Um, she's useless now. He, I was all about DS Fringe McBangs, but she's let me down. Because J- Jeff went round to her recently and was like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to um, drop Yasmin in it when her trial comes up. And she's like, why, why not? And now she's hearing all this and she's like, oh, just no evidence, unfortunately. So they they go off on the hunt for a little bit more. Speed dial time. Faye asked Jeff, "Who was that woman then?" And um, that um, that you were having an argument with yesterday. And his lie that he comes up on the spot with was very topical. Somebody who coughed on me. And then they got we got ratty at each other because she couldn't keep her social distance. And she seems she seems to fall for it for a little bit. I have to say, if you did this for every person in the greater Manchester area. Also, anybody who's not wearing a face mask on the tram, you wouldn't ever get anything done. No, you just have to. You have to just put Every up with giving them person. evil, evil stares. You can't do it with a face mask on. Mm. It looks like you're smiling. <laughs> um, so anyway, Abney then arrives at speed dial, and Jeff's like, "Oh, what's happened now?" So he um, is. He's. I think Harley is um, buggered off at this point. Oh no, it was Faye. Sorry, it was Faye. Did I say earlier? Earlier. Faye asked Jeff who this woman was. Yeah. Jeff lies to his granddaughter and tells her that it was some woman that coughed on her. Some some festering pool of corona that splurted all over him. Corona lady. Faye goes off during this police interview and then comes back in to overhear Jeff saying, No, I didn't speak to anybody in the Abbey at the alley. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. He he, he confirm, reconfirms all his lies. He says, Oh yeah, my first wife, she died of breast cancer in nineteen seventy something. Whoever's tell, telling all these tales about her has still been alive didn't must be start... just playing a cruel trick on me. Poor innocent Jeff. Didn't he start this nonsense about she moved to Spain and died there? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, she's died over I in Spain. I hate it when people do that. I wonder whether that's gonna um like, will there be records? Maybe not no, from 1970 something. No, they don't have them in something. Spain, Michael. It's, <laughs> everybody knows this. In Spain, if you die, they just push you over the border to uh, France. Fine. And go, Ooh. Roll you over the Pyrenees. Anyway, Faye overhears Abney's summary at the end of this. And she's like, what was all that about? And she's, and he says, Joe, oh, go and ask your stepmother. In fact, don't. But he gives, Je- he gives Faye some evils from the kitchen after that because he knows that she's heard something that she shouldn't have done. Well, he doesn't want it to hear. Yeah. So back at home, Tim and Sally are arguing yet again about Jeff. And then Faye says, oh, oh it, about this about this woman in the street. And says, oh, I, yeah, I saw Jeff and the woman arguing in the street. Jeff comes in, cross that he's now been questioned by the police again. Sally's having none of this. She says, well, it's your own fault. You're a massive liar. You're lying to the police. You're lying to Tim. Now you're lying to Faye because you told her that, that you were arguing with somebody or you, you didn't deny you were denying somebody. You lied to somebody and now it's just like you're saying something else to the police. It's time you told the truth, mister. Right. So then the scene cuts to Friday, but only present are Tim, Sally and Jeff. Not, not Faye's not there. No, I think Faye, Faye was just kind of popping up in the background at the end Faye's of Wednesday's like, episode. The latest guys, my Backstreet's boys CDs are not going to clean themselves. <laughs> so it seems like Jeff is struggling to find a way out of this one. He, he says, I think his excuse is that this coughing woman, turn, he realised afterwards that he... He's full of crap. He's I like, can't remember what his something, excuse something, something. was, but Sally's not having any of it. Tim falls for it hook, line and sinker. He says, oh yeah, I didn't realise that this coughing woman, She. it turned out that she was the one that's been causing all the <laughs> grief. So she coughed on me. And then, and then I, I said, hang off. on a minute, I recognise that, that sounds, no, that sounds like a cough of somebody who spreads not only Corona, but malicious lies about me. And I don't... Whatever. T- Tim, who was willing to accept any falsity heard, that comes out of his dad's mouth falls for this but you've heard of the sunk cost fallacy right which one's that this is where you you do stuff like say you have a car and it's always breaking down and you buy or oh, how about a laptop that breaks because some idiot pours water on it and you take it to the shop and it costs you 150 quid to fix it I, and I then can, yeah I let's say the battery situation. starts to break as well yes and you think to yourself, well, I can't get a new one because I've already paid 150 quid to get this repaired. I, I better, I know get, exactly I better spend about. more money 
on getting it repaired because you've already put money into it mm-hmm. but actually it would make more sense just to buy a new laptop at this point and I think that, that something similar is happening here with, with Tim where he's thinking oh, I, believe it, I believe this and I believe that so I might as well believe this that and the other thing as well mm. do you know what I mean I've come stupid. this far now I can't if, if I were to admit he was lying that would make me look stupid yeah <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's exactly the same thing but um, anyway, Alia finds out that Yasmin needs a heart bypass, so that's going to keep her out of action for a little while longer, and the trial that's will be delayed. Dramatic, isn't it? Seemingly indefinitely. I don't yeah. know very much about heart bypasses, but I would not have thought that Yasmin. Was I wouldn't want one myself. Um, but I could probably do with one if can, my, heart, my own heart was going it. to, you know, fall to bits. That's what you get when you eat a murdered chicken. So this is when Alia gives very slim Craig a call to check out what the police are up to. And he is so so. Felt. I just can't get over it. It looks absolutely <laughs> fantastic. Turn sideways if you can see him. I like how he says, look, I'm not, you can't just phone up, phone me up every time you want to know what the police are up to. What, Craig, you don't want to be in it? <laughs> he's going to be, he's going to, he just tells everything, doesn't he? He's not really, I'm sure he's an excellent police officer, but he's not he's, so good at keeping details one, of his cases. Yeah, but the thing is, if he, if, Secret, he wasn't, Miss Friends. if he wasn't spilling the beans on the police operations... He wouldn't be in it, so he can shut up, can't he? <laughs> um, anyway, he says, look, give it a couple of days, and if you don't hear anything from Elaine, because, by the way, Jeff's still claiming there was no woman, I'm going to have another, I'm gonna have another word with my a detective mates. I, d- I don't really see the point, that, that seems... Just... There are a few scenes in tonight's episode, like Carla with her recorder, that <laughs> still seemed a little bit fillerish. I would love to see a detective murder mystery show starring Craig Tinker... And Pam Hobsworth. Mm. I, that's all I need that, to that's say. It. Fine. That's all I need to say because that's a stunning combination. Okay, we'll put Even that down. Even though they never met on screen. Meanwhile, Sally still won't give up trying to get Jeff to spill the beans about what's been going on. And Tim's like, that's enough. He's there. He's brooding away, isn't he, in the front of the, yeah. the, front of the scene. And you can tell he's thinking it. The, the, little, the little cogs are, are whirring. The hamsters get got yeah, up. It totally is. And he's like, that's, that's enough of that. So, They're normally so nocturnal, so this is quite a thing. Sally makes Jeff go and says to Tim, look, you just got to wake up. And so Tim says, don't make me choose between him and you. Oh, now that's a thing to say, isn't it? And it is. It, he's like basically saying at this point, whatever my dad says, he is my dad and blood's thicker than water and all that. And, and it's all... and. Yeah, I can't. Whatever, whatever lies he spins, I can't turn my back on him because he's yeah, my dad. I do feel sorry for him because you, I feel sorry for Tim. Yeah, because I mean, Tim's known this guy who has been, you know, a fairly decent dad to him. We you know there's been a few you know, issues. <laughs> there's been Doubt a few. Dog, there's been a few bits where perhaps not been a fantastic dad. But after fifty years, it must be impossible to turn your back on somebody, and you would you'd just believe it all, wouldn't you? Especially if you. Are you a bit simple like Tim? And you Tim's not really got very much going on in the higher cognitive regions of his brain. No, he'd rather just he'd just he's rather like, have a happy life and believe him. Pint and a pie, leave me alone. Yep. So Jeff goes up to Alia who's doing a sweeping outside speed <laughs> dial. I quite like that scene. They end up arguing again. There's just lots of arguing with Jeff over this week. She ends up whacking her broom against yeah, the wall. Yeah, she's like a plucky. Well she's a all I need is an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, um, it's like the beginning of a kung fu movie. I know, I want to see her like do a, do a spin of it and... Yeah, like start thwacking him. What would she do? Yeah, thwacking him this way, that way. Like poke him in like the tummy a... button with the, with, the, with the blunt end. Like it's a bow. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know whether there's a sharp end to a broom, I assume not. Although maybe you if Alia... a sharp end Maybe to if Alia pulls, her, pulls the head off the broom, then it's, it's, it's jagged. If this was like a proper kung fu movie, it. she would pull the head off the broom and then sharpen the point on the, on the cobbles. Yeah. Anyway, she starts saying, she, she she knows that he's had something to do with Elaine's disappearance and he kind of denies doing anything, but he, do, he does say, well, look, if you want, you can find out what kind of man I am, just like she did. So he, just he like did Elaine a, did. Yeah, like Elaine did. So he does a bit of Gary, doesn't he? Who was who was also not really denying that he killed Rick. I'm surprised. Jeff is pretty much admitting to Alia here that yes, I know what's happened to to Elaine. I'm surprised he didn't go. Don't worry about Elaine. She's safe as houses. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he's gonna. I want this to be a bit like a. Um, I don't know a bit like with the you know when Phelan shot Luke and he's like, you wanted to find Andy. Well, now you're gonna go and see him or something like yeah. that. And it's like you're going the same way as Elaine if you don't shut up, Alia. Come on, Jeff. You'll be your best friend. Where the Jeff. hell are your catchphrases, man? <laughs> Back at home. Cause, oh, yeah, because t- Tim comes in and very handily whisks Jeff away at this point. So Tim's starting to question at this point everything he ever thought about himself. And he is not liking that. And Jeff says, he, he pulls out a photo of um, Tessa out of his wallet at this point, of them on holiday we together, having a this. lovely time on the beach. And he's like, so this is your mum. You know this is your mum. This has been your mum all your life. Don't say now that this woman who loved you unconditionally, you're starting to believe that she wasn't. Of course she was. You've got to be on my side, Tim. Everyone's turning against me. And Tim's like, I am on your side, Dad. But you've got to start being more honest with me. And Jeff does like an evil little grin as he goes up the stairs because he knows he's got Tim back on his side again. I am honestly surprised that Tim knows enough about his mum to know what her actual first name was. Because he seems like the sort of person, if you said, Tim, what was your mum's name? He would be like, Mum, what, what do you mean? Her name was Mum. <laughs> yeah. True. Also, just this sort of bloke, he would separate you from your friends so much to the extent that you probably would stop to exist as a separate person <laughs> and especially if he called her mum you know yeah. like some parents call each other mum and dad yeah i can imagine tim growing up not knowing what his mum's first name <laughs> well, was i was a bit confused about this because i was under the impression that um things weren't all particularly too happy in the metcalf household when tim was growing up and because we haven't heard a whole lot about Tessa before now, but I thought that Jeff was basically saying she was a massive waste of he space. He said this before, she was an alcoholic as well. Yeah. But I think I think the point he's making is... And also, it, again, it's another example of, of Jeff trying to manipulate the situation where he's he said before, and he's gone on record saying, Tessa was an awful person, she was an alcoholic, she was abusive, she was terrible, blah, blah, blah but he's still trying to defend this woman to Tim. Mm. So that's kind of giving him a bit of street cred here too. Like, oh, even though this woman was was not very nice to me, she was still a great mum to you, or she loved you at least, because you can be a terrible person and still love somebody. I mean, yeah. that's what, you know, that's what Jeff and Yasmin are going I want, I mean, Tessa's definitely dead now, I assume. Um, I wonder when the last time that she was in contact with Tim was. Don't know. Anyway, moving on. Sally, at the end of the episode, finds Tim having another brood in the cab office and says, again, you've got to say the truth about this. He says, no, I'm, I've, I've, I've decided I'm going to be sticking with Jeff. I'm going to let the police do their job. I'm keeping out of all this, and, and you need to as well. And Sally's like, no, let, let's just go and find Elaine. And he's like, no, I'm not interested. So when, and then she, um, she leaves, he finds a letter on the floor. And this is the letter that... Elaine brought round to the cab office last week when she was talking to him and she'd written her phone number on her, hadn't she? Yes. She, it's, it was, it's, it's got it's, her address on one side and her phone number on the back. Bill, yeah. Which she has had delivered to her house. So it's got her address and name on it, hmm. but she used it to write her phone number, which now will not work because Tim has taken her SIM card. Jeff has taken her SIM card. J- Jeff. And so Tim, surely, she'll have no choice but to visit the address next week one would hope but the the image that we're left with at the end of today's episode is him screwing up the envelope and checking it in the bin i don't think that will last very long at all do you not do you think he's do you think he's gonna pick it out of the bin i don't know Unless i think what what that's a complete dead end then what's the well point I, I, I was wondering there? whether i don't know I, I i was wondering like was today's episode just like just round in circles and no development with the plot there because i was almost thinking that this is going to be the point when Tim, you know, decides I'm going to be on Team Sally now. But it seems... I don't think this is a red herring. I suppose it, I suppose the point of today's episode that shows that Tim is um, able to be, you know, manipulated onto... Well, no, no, convinced, sorry, to, to come over to Sally's side. But he just needs a little bit more... Yeah, a little bit more convincing to, to stay there for good. What... The thing, the thing that I think people might be missing is what is Elaine offering Tim to make him go from believing Jeff to believing Elaine yeah she hasn't got Nothing. anything that he wants There's, the truth is painful and for Tim to admit that she's his mum 
he's also now going to have to admit that Jeff is the victim in what's happened between him and Yasmin. And that's going to just destroy a found, the foundation of his mm. He'd rather just be blissfully ignorant, wouldn't they? There's literally no reason for him to believe this. It might be compelling to everybody else from the outside, but what reason would you really have? And and I know that they said, oh, you know, well, what you know, why would she lie? What would she have to gain? All Tim had to say was, she was my ex-girlfriend, and he don't know why he didn't do this. Jeff. Oh, sorry. <laughs> if Jeff had said, yeah, this woman was my girlfriend before we before I had you and we got together after you after your mum died you know just make out she's always been in and out of his life and she's always trying to mess with him and and ru- try and ruin things and she said crazy stuff before and you know you can make up any load of lies you wanted to make it look as though she's the crazy one and she's always lying because I said before I think I said last week like why would anyone lie about this but actually if you think about it there are people who get obsessed with other people and you can imagine Jeff doing this to Yasmin actually if you if you look to the future you can just imagine Yasmin getting herself a nice little rose rosy cottage with a thatched roof and a nice sort of um, retired professor husband pottering around the garden and suddenly Jeff rocks up out of nowhere and starts lying about all this kind of stuff that Yasmin, you know, chucks mm. him in prison and all this, you know, lied about him beating her up. There, there, there are people who are this loony mm. and Jeff is one of them, so... I think it's still going to be gnawing away at Tim though, but I, 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 I'm not sure about this letter. Because, What's I mean, the point of having it? What, why would it just be in to, there? Just to symbolise, no, I'm not having anything more to yeah, do with that. Yeah, but everybody forgot about I'm it. I'm throwing it away. Yeah, I suppose so. Everyone had forgotten what it was. People on Twitter are like, what's this letter? I don't know what this letter is. I mean, I suppose um, Sally could come in and find it in the bin or, or fail yeah, or Steve true. or someone like that. Or, or Eileen, because doesn't Eileen still work there? And she's kind of on Sally's side, isn't she? Most people, really, at the moment... The only people on Jeff's side are Tim and Faye. Hmm. Everyone Although else is either if, on the fence or they've decided he's a liar. I suppose if Eileen found the letters, she's got no reason to she don't know who Elaine to is. remark. No, no. So what do you think? What do you think's happened to Elaine? Oh, I don't think she's, she's dead. She's not dead, is she? We've I would seen love this it if she was dead. To, I wouldn't. I don't, I don't want Jeff to go down the murdery route. But really, she's such a good, great actress. They would be, it would be silly of them to kill her off so early in the storyline. Mm. Um, I, I honestly just think that Jeff just drove somewhere, stuck his finger in her face and went, I'm going to ruin your life if you try and ruin my life and you know I can do it and you don't have the guts to, to do what it takes to get me back for everything mm. I've done to you. T- snatches her phone off her and says, you never contact me or my family again. You don't speak to Tim. You don't speak to Sally. You don't come back to Weatherfield. If I ever see you again, I'm going to do to you what I'm going to do to your SIM card. <laughs> Throw it down the drain. Throw it down the drain. <laughs> Do you think that literally what it was? Because I was wondering. It, the only thing that was making me think that maybe he has you know, done away with her is how how has he got the phone? Because he just took the phone off her and went, you are not allowed to come near me or my family again and I'm taking your phone off you. What are you going to do about it? And honestly, if you're so scared of him and Which he is, is physically intimidating anyway and he, you know, he's, he's a man, she's, an, she's a woman... He could he could still probably do some serious physical damage to her mm. if he takes her phone off of her and just goes you know what now what are you gonna do and she literally goes there's nothing I can do that would make her then think yeah what can I, what do I think can I can really do here they they did enough to show that she was very very hesitant about coming forward didn't they so if yeah. if he did just say that kind of stuff but seriously to her, if you've been abused by somebody for years and years and years, and then you pluck up the courage to come and try and confront them, and then just take your phone off you and go, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And you're like, nothing. You would then have your spirit crushed and not want to... Hmm. But, I mean, I wonder how he got her in the car, because there were countless people walking past at opportune moments You probably just went get in the her. car. There were, I, I, I do think that somebody would see that. But I'm, maybe I'm just used to in Coronation is, Street to everybody happening to see things listen, and need seeing. Women have gone, have, have been murdered by people they don't even know. 
in by being told to do stuff because we are so in, it's so ingrained in us to be polite and not make a fuss and not not draw attention to ourselves it'll be polite and likable women are murdered because we're too nice and El elaine if she if she's intimidated enough to the point at which she was too scared to even think and jeff told her to get in the car she probably would do mm. so it takes a lot of really conscious effort to undo decades worth of not just people pleasing in general but doing what jeff told you to do mm. it's like brainwashing i think i think another re i think other reasons why he can't have killed her is for one it'd be a seriously risky thing to do at the moment he knows that the police are being informed about elaine he knows that sally is like a dog with a bone um if he was if he killed her then i don't know how we'd be able to lie his way out of that one but equally i'm also wondering what about elaine's other friends and family surely they'd notice that she was missing yeah. so she, she's got a whole life she, for the past 50 years she's led a completely different life and you can't just you know pluck someone out of that and, and hope that nobody's going to notice that she's gone. I would hope that she had moved on to a less abusive relationship. Yeah, I mean, I, d I don't know whether she said whether, whether she was she, in, a, yes. in a relationship but at the moment. I wanted to be, I wanted to be getting out with some big beefy guy who comes and just pummels Jeff in. Um, I, I, to be honest, I think that she's. I, I think that she's just going to show up at the trial. I'm. You, you say that Jeff's going to go around to find a house next week. It Tim. Would, Tim. <laughs> oh my gosh, why are we doing this? How can we confuse Tim and Jeff? I don't know. I, I've got a feeling that we might not see her until the Honestly trial thing, and she's going to show up and, and give the, the damning evidence that's anything needed. Anything that's happened between between Jeff and Elaine to stop her from turning back up on the street, whatever he did to get her phone off her, we are never going to find this out. We're just going to have to put together what happened. Mm. You know... Yeah. I mean, I wonder how much Alia... Because she seems intent on finding Elaine. I wonder, I wonder how easy it would be to track her down. Because she, surely she could you know, do a bit of Googling, whatever. I don't know how hard it is to track people down that you're really Elaine intent Jones on finding not a very, at the moment. Very... It's not exactly a standout name, is it? No, that's true. I don't there know. must be loads of Elaine Jones. Mm. And she and I think that the envelopes that she lived in Bolton. Yeah, it did. So it's not even like Alia can go. Well, she must be from Manchester. Yeah, it must be in Weatherfield. Like you don't yeah. know where she's. She could be from anywhere. Mm. So even even if she found an Elaine Jones in Bolton, how would she know that was the right one? Yeah. Mm. Interesting stuff. And also, if you think about it, if she does have friends and family, they probably would know of what she was up to. So if a random woman comes going, oh, you, I'm looking for Elaine Jones, you know who she is, they probably would go, no, I don't know who she is, go away, rather than... Yeah, I mean, I suppose that we've got to remember as well, though, that Craig did say that he was going to chase this missing Elaine up after a few days if she doesn't turn up, does... so... The... Well, yeah, there you go, then. The, the letter could be a complete red herring, but I think it isn't. But they... I'm just trying to think that the, the, Elaine hasn't spoken to the police, has she? No. So they're not going to necessarily know exactly who she is either. As all they know is that she is a person called Elaine Jones but, and used to be called Philippa Jones. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. I'm sure this will continue. Right, okay. Let's, let's do the Gary story then. Let's move on, Gemma. What's have you been up to this week? The bad lad. So he's still in hospital at the beginning of the week and Sarah goes to visit him. and With a mask. Yeah, she's got her mask on. And she, she says, I don't want him to be... I don't want you to be sent down... But what you've done is wrong, naughty. I.e. killing Rick. And then she brings up the, this, this elephant in the room that's been sort of... And this in, is what we were talking about last week on the podcast. The fact that it? he knows what happened when Callum died. So that live episode all those years ago when Kylie killed Callum with a, with a wrench in the Platt house because he was trying to rape Sarah. This has been a secret that was kept. Went went to the grave with Kylie, but, but both David and and Sarah were there, so they know what happened. And, and Gary does as well. So he points out 
that what I've done, what I've done is no worse than what you did when you pinned Callum's murder on Tony. Because the official story, as we've mentioned previously, is still that Tony, Tony aka Stewart. Jason's dad, was the one who killed Callum, mm. the drug dealer. So she says immediately, what, are you trying to blackmail me? And he says, I'd never do that to you. And she suddenly realises that there's more just at stake here than she, and she doesn't know really if she can trust him. Why would he bring it up if he has no intention of using it? I, I genuinely think he thinks that he wouldn't blackmail her, but I do think that when the chips were down, he probably would. If he had to, to save his own skin. Yeah. Um, so... She, she leaves and he starts... Um pulling all his... Oh, his, his uh, cannulas Yeah, off. cannulas and his... Blah, 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 blah. At home, Adam tells Sarah that Maria says that she was at the hospital and he's, like, really, really suspicious of, about why she was there. Yeah, because she lied she, yeah, she, about she where she was. There. And he's like, where were you, where were you? And then a police officer turns up. This was really fascinating because Sarah is a <laughs> terrible liar. She's awful, but, but that's she... really, really in character. We've seen her be an awful liar in the past. She's Tina's very good at acting like somebody <laughs> who's look totally shifty. I think she thinks she's a, she's a good liar, but she really isn't. Yeah. So she's sitting there on the sofa. The police officer's interrogating her and Adam's sitting in the background, draped around a, a chair, sort of like watching her like a hawk as she's answering all these questions in like a really clumsy way and she recounts the the she recounts what happened but then the police the detective picks holes in what her what she said and it's like sarah thinks that she's got a watertight story yeah. <laughs> doesn't she and, the and the, like, she's like oh yeah right. i ran across the road and then i was running for my tram and then gary saved my life and everything's fine now. And the police officer was like, well, you were on the phone to the police when you got hit. So, because the 909 call, the the person on the other end of the phone heard, you get, heard Gary get run over by a car. So explain that. And Adam's like, yeah, explain that. So then she says, oh no, I, that reminds me. <laughs> Actually, you know what? <laughs> what happened was... I, re- I thought that someone was stealing my car. So I was on the phone to try to report that. Um, but I and forgot I about that. Forgot I forgot because, about that, yeah. because I'm in shock. And the police officer's like, uh-huh. you're in shock. Adam's, Adam's well, the, the like... The police officer is doing a, a fairly good job of pretending to believe her, I The thought. thing is, the police officer is probably thinking, I don't know what the hell is going on here or why this crazy lunatic is lying, but it's more paperwork than I can be bothered to do in August. So <laughs> she says, you know, it's, you know, it's a crime to lie to the police. And Sarah's like, huh, wow, that would be good if I was lying, but I'm not. Isn't it odd that Gary's there? Uh, maybe, I don't see, know. See, that thing, I was like, no, it's not odd that Gary's there. He's if, there all the time. Everyone's when always there. Everyone's everywhere. always there, just at an opportune moment in Coronation Street. So I think that, I, I wouldn't count that. But yeah, the whole 999 call what the at the time. What the police hmm. woman should have said was, so Gary was there. Were you having a conversation about him? <laughs> that he wasn't to overhear at the time because that, that would, would totally explain, explain his presence though, yeah. <laughs> anyway the police lady's like look I don't know what you were up to but I'm going to assume it was a weird sex thing <laughs> 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 I'm going and then once she leaves Adam says now she's gone you can tell me the truth but I don't think she ever does well, no, she she can't. she just kind of weasels out of it. She's like, "Oh, didn't you like a woman with an air of mystery?" <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was sexy. <laughs> um, so at the flat, Gary. Then this was quite. <laughs> this is hilarious. This was funny in our house, not in yeah. our house, in our, in our Airbnb flat. So Gary Gary writes and writes and um, addresses envelopes and carefully arranges them on their lovely breakfast bar, <laughs> and one of them says Nicola. One of them says Maria, and then I say, "Who's one two two four? What's that? <laughs> one two two four? Do you think that's is that like the code to his his safe houses thing?" <laughs> and you're like, "It says Izzy." I was like, "Oh, oh, Izzy." <laughs> it did, then we had to rewind it, didn't it? It did look quite like one two two four. It really did look like one two two four, but that's now her. Remember code Izzy? Name. Remember her? I didn't. <laughs> 
So it looks as though he's written a series of either suicide notes, I, I don't assume no. so, or I... just explanations, or perhaps just like, you know, Maria, please remember, you must use up the marmalade before you open the jam or whatever it is. I, I do wonder what it was. But anyway... Because it was he... Oh, no, let's just talk about that. Because well, was, was it confessions? Was, that it, was he about to go on the run? Because he discharged himself from hospital, hadn't they? Because he knows that Sarah kind of wants to tell the truth and maybe will. So Yeah, so this is him fresh from the hospital. Was he about to go and join Todd in the woods? Yeah. He's going to be a, um, a wood man. Mm, I, don't, I wonder whether I don't know how he had time to write all these letters. But. It's probably, to be honest, Gary's not a deep thinker. It's probably not like an elaborately styled confession full of philosophical ponderings. Mm. Like, I killed Rick, see you later. Yeah. Keep the watch. I can't believe that he'd be so quick to give up on his two children, though. Uh, he's such an Poor involved Zach dad. Poor and the other one. Exactly. He's not Jake. a very involved father, is he? <laughs> he's really not. He maybe stuffed a few fibres in probably, each envelope for them. And so. Maybe each envelope contained, like, Christmas cards and birthday cards up until the age they turn 18. Maybe. Maybe. I, want, I really would like for those cards to show up at some point. They might There do. needs to be a mass envelope finding in next week's Coro. We need to find Elaine's envelope. We need to find these envelopes. I would love it. I wonder who, who would these. be the most dramatic person to read them out. One, two, two, four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, um, I mean, it'd be handy if Gary, I'm sure he would love to find, put his hands on these. Gary? Uh, sorry, Adam would love, would love to put his hands on these. Or Imran, because he's been strangely absent yes. from this story. He's, I don't care about this anymore. Um, I've got a kid to foster. So anyway, yeah, this was, this is very interesting. I hope he has, well, for his sake, I hope he's disposed of these in a... At the top of a bin somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to find for our, that would be for our sake. Tests. Anyway, Adam comes in and he quickly, Gary quickly grabs all, well, he doesn't see the envelopes and Gary gets rid of them after this scene. But he comes in and says, were you with Sarah before the incident? And he's like, no. And then Adam says... Sarah, I don't know why he does this. This seems really crazy to me. Adam goes, Gary, don't worry about anything. Sarah lied for you. Don't know why. Just thought you'd like to know. Okay, bye. Thanks. He, he, he basically, yeah, he doesn't really believe Sarah, does he? This but was he, really, this he made tells no him, sense. Sarah's saying what you're saying. This so, made no mm. sense. This really made no sense. Adam's far too clever to have done something like this. This is just clumsy writing. Why would Adam go around and tell Adam tell Gary something that's good in, that's information that Gary needs to know that he did not know previously? Good point. It didn't make any sense. So he's like, "Yeah, don't worry about it." So then Gary takes the letters back. <sighs> Bernie sees Adam in the shop and notices that he's got this watch, and she's like, "Oh, I thought your watch no, no, was broken." It's the, no, it's not. He's got a new watch. She spots on his wrist this. This is she sees his old watch with the broken clasp. Oh, it's fixed. Yeah, and he's, that's what I mean. Yeah, he's got his old watch on. She's yeah. uh, it's broken. And she says, "Oh, watch out, because Sarah's bought you a new watch." That's right. That's yeah. Right. Then he goes home and asks Sarah about his watch, and she she's again. She just goes, "Yeah, like uh, what happened was <laughs> um, she was that um, I got a watch from like Bernie, and like I was like, oh." Oh, this is rubbish. I was going to give it to David. It's like a joke. Because, like, me and David, I don't know if you know this about us, but we're always buying each other joke presents. She and Jeff are, like, totally opposite ends of the scale about plausible lies that they so, come so, up with. So then, but then I thought, no, and then I just took it to a charity shop. <laughs> and he's like, what? She's like, yeah, totally, babe. <laughs> but, then he, but then this is the same voice she uses when... When Adams, you know, goes, so babe, how was that? She's like, yeah, like, that was the best. <laughs> that was the best I've ever had in bed. Like, you are the best lover ever. So he's just like, it's in my interest to believe that this <laughs> kind of voice is completely sincere. <laughs> so anyway, um, so he keeps trying to ask her questions, but she will not say anything, will she? No. On Wednesday, they decide, Adam's like... Um, I'll just make up with you because 
it's kind of cute that you can't lie. <laughs> it's, how, it's kind of handy for me in the future. <laughs> Gary comes into the factory and he says, you know what, everybody, I'm not going to raise the rent after all. I don't want to be that kind of person. If you want to throw a party, you feel free. Adam chases after him and says... No, Sarah chases after him. Sarah, Sarah, I know the name's wrong to my Sarah chases after him and he says, don't, you don't have to bribe... No, you, she says, you don't have to bribe me because I'm not going to tell anybody. Mm. Then Maria and Peter are there and Carla is talking. They're all, they're all like very socially distanced. So it's quite funny. Yeah, Maria's talking about how um, nobody's buying furniture at the moment during this pandemic. It's weird. It's weird that nobody wants um, a rattan chair with all the rattan falling off. And Carla says, it's strange actually because... Um, Gary was going to raise the rent and then he said he wasn't going to so I thought he was doing well and Maria's like what the hell are you talking about we're not doing very well at all so this is all a bit odd and on Friday Carla and Peter are talking and Carla's like oh it's very odd that Maria doesn't know what the hell's going on with finances and everything because she seems to think that they're not doing very well, but Gary Gary doesn't want to raise the rent. And Peter's like, don't worry about it. This is boring. And then Adam says, comes in and says that Peter was... What? Adam comes in and, and, and says, oh, I don't know. He tells Peter about... He basically about, just starts... He says, I've been round with Maria about Gary again. And Peter says, shut up about it. Don't worry about it. Don't get involved. Gary com- comes home... And somehow it seems as though the mar- the wedding between Maria and Gary is, seems pretty imminent. No, imminent. Sarah, not Maria. Yes, the the this what no Ad, this is what happened. Adam, sorry, heat. It's the temperature, Scratch everybody. That. Scratch Adam that. comes into the Rovers and says, "I've been round with Sarah about Gary." What? That's what Adam says. Me and Sarah have been having argy bodies about Gary, and Peter How? says, "Look, just leave it." Yeah, see, this is trouble. I tried to carefully... I, I thought, I keep saying the wrong names, so I'm going to carefully read out what was written here. Yeah, and, and it turns out that you wrote the, the wrong, wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's still true to say that Gary and Maria are getting married and it seems imminent. It does, but somebody mentioned today that she's not going to be able to get the wedding of her dreams, which I think is supposed to be a reference to who knows what's going on with weddings at the moment and can you have a wedding in party of 30 or more no, or, yeah so i think they were just saying that which is interesting as well because it also made me think about tim and sally's wedding which i think is supposed to have happened at this point i mean they obviously haven't got married on screen but i thought that they were setting those two up to have a kind of a late spring wedding and i don't think it's been mentioned about when they're supposed to be it getting... ain't spring anymore no and I, and I don't think that they're in any particular mood to catch married at the moment i don't not... think that it would be a wise move Really, no, really so I, I'm I'm ki- I'm kind of wondering at the moment whether this wedding between Sally and Tim is just going to get quietly forgotten, you know, about. forgotten about and shoved under the just carpet, like and we're just and no, well, they were never supposed to get married, and I think they're still not supposed to be married. But I'm thinking of more like um, Kirk and Beth, who never officially got married again after the whole bigamy debacle, did they? Debacle. Debacle. Anyway, I think, I think, yeah, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about Gary and Maria. Yeah, it seems and like the, the wedding is coming up. Gary is talking about getting a, a best man makes me think that this is actually... I don't know why this kind of snuck up on me, but I think it's because in Corrie, people get engaged all the bloody time and then don't do anything about it. Mm. So Maria is starts to confront him about the fact that she knows that he didn't... He, nixed the the rent raise and she accuses him of doing it because he is in love with sarah and she he says no that's not true i just felt bad about the fact of losing money and he talks about the fact that you know we're going through a global pandemic and nobody's buying knickers and he felt bad about them probably going through i mean it would be you'd have to be a spectacularly uh awful person to raise the rent on a business and not really it it's it it somewhat ebony's a scroogey isn't it so he says yeah i've just felt really bad about it and also because nick's going through a bad time with ollie i don't know if you've heard about that that seems pretty bad i think <laughs> 
Maria and seems to buy this. Maria just like, and he, he okay, like babe. gives her some flannel about how wonderful she is and what a fantastic, you know, and he's, oh, I loved Sarah, but I love him even more and all that rubbish. And then Sarah go, goes home and she and Adam are chatting about the factory. And then Sarah goes, oh, isn't it great? We've had a whole conversation. We haven't mentioned Gary once. Immediately jinxing the whole thing. Mm. Um, so do you think that Maria has been convinced now as she... She heard all that she needs to hear from, from Mr. Windass. I don't bloody know. I think that she's fairly... She's not, again, a bit like Tim. She's not the brightest spark. But also... It, it seems con- very convenient to her to believe this guy much. who has been uh, showering her in gifts and, uh, and, and, and arranging this wedding and everything. It, it's more trouble than it's worth to you know, try and pick holes in his stories. Yeah, very much like with Tim, it is not to her benefit to probe... Mm. because the the truth is very convenient yeah it still feels I mean, like the it, truth is very convenient. it still feels like it could end up going down some kind of love triangle route particularly with adam and sarah's incredibly shaky relationship at the moment which was never particularly rock solid They're to not begin putting with any effort in at all are they no like a few like a month ago he was there whining and dining laura Nealon, and now she's it feels like she's still got some feelings for Gary because she's just lying to her husband for yeah. him. He's there almost trying to investigate her from the background. Who's I ha- he? Adam. I must say, I am really enjoying watching Adam throughout all of this. I'm going back and forth as the, as the weeks go on about whether I like Adam or not. And this week, I think he's been great, just in the back of shots going, hmm, hmm. basically. Yeah. I, I really, really loved his expression. Yeah. When the police officer was interrogating Sarah about the accident, and he was like, "This is going to be good." Mm. So he doesn't believe her. She, she's going to fight. She, she, I would think that she, she has found out kind of about Laura. I don't know how much more there is to find because he, well, he didn't tell her everything, did he? And I think he would have gone further with Laura if he thought it would have been in his ben- it would have been beneficial to him if he would have if he'd have got to Rick through her or found out more about Rick there's just th- their marriage is holding is being held together by a thread so it's just gonna, I, th- I think it's not going to be long before it snaps and she twangs back over to Gary I think maybe I'm around the time of when this wedding's supposed to be happening just throwing putting it out there um <sighs> Anyway, so, so that was that. I mean, I think we've talked about everything else that's been going on here. Any any other bits to discuss on this one? Oh, uh, there's there was a filler story about Kirk. Oh, yeah. Saying that he thought that they should make nightcaps. Oh, Why would you wear a hat in August in bed? <laughs> I'm sure everybody knows what I thought about that story. So and I'll there was no also more. a filler story about how actually Carlo's fantastic. Well, she plays the flute the recorder Philip, recorder yeah what was it that she said that she could play the beach boys or something wasn't it monkey daydream believer like <laughs> i hate it when people like do you know that song daydream believer what that really really famous song that everybody I've knows i've never heard of the what the monkeys <laughs> that's a crazy name for a band what kind of lunatics would call their band the monkeys <laughs> so with this um it's so- not like it was on british television every Freaking Sunday for about ten years. Um, have the police? It's not like Davy Jones was in Coronation Street. <laughs> <laughs> Ina Sharples, what was it? Grandson or something? <laughs> Do you think that the police are just buying Sarah's story and they don't need to investigate it further because care. it's like I don't, well, don't think they care. everybody involved seems What's to be agreeing mystery? with each other here. It's like, it's like, what can we prove out of this? Mm. What can we prove? It's a bit weird, yeah. But you know. Uh, I can imagine being a police officer, the amount of times you think to yourself, that's a bit weird, every day, would be enormous. Shall I investigate this further? No. Nah. What, what am I going to get out of it? Paperwork? No, thank you. Mm. What, I mean, what's the crime? She phoned, she, she like, I, I, wouldn't, I said to you that she should pretend to be psychic. Yeah. Because honestly, that would have made just as much sense. And if she had like, when she, well, that's why she phoned the, uh, the, the police earlier. I could tell that there was going to be an accident. Like, she was so... She comes up with the most bizarre lies. I'm surprised that she didn't say something I thought like my that. car was being stolen and then it wasn't, I forgot. 
also that I thought my car was being stolen. Because Adam even asked her later, what do you, what's, how, why did you think your car was being stolen? And she went, oh, questions, boring questions, stop asking me questions. <laughs> But really, if she had just said, I, was, I had a psychic premonition that Gary was going to get run over by a car, the police officer would have gone, oh, so you're nuts. Okay, cool. I'll just write that down. I'm going. Oh, you're the one that thought that, she, that, her, that their son was being was channeling his dead father from yeah. beyond the grave. Yeah, oh, it says here, you, it's got, you. you got sectioned. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's cool. <laughs> Tell you what, give me six numbers for Saturday, and if it, if it pans out, I'll be back next week. <laughs> But if it doesn't, we'll just call it quits. What do you say? Right, Ollie Wobble's story. We just had a couple of scenes with Toya, Leanne and um, Mandy from Antenatal on Wednesday's episode. Um, it turns out that Leanne and Nick are looking for a new school for Ollie and they've also got a fancy new chair for him because he needs one. What is an SEN school? Because I don't Special know. Special educational needs. Okay. Because he's a bit behind, and, doesn't and he? And in this country, we have special schools, do we? Oh yes, they exist. Not everybody has to. Not everybody with special education needs goes to a, 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 an SEN school, but but they are their places for. They're their places for them. The children. It feels like um, that might be the right place Where for Ollie at the moment. Where you would have like adapted rooms and yeah. more. You get more. Um, more yeah, specialist staff care per person, and they've got different training and stuff. Exactly. So they want all that for Ollie. To go. So. Um, Outside the shop, this is where Leanne bumps into Mandy from antenatal class, whose life seemed pretty perfect like now. Apart from the fact that she said, uh, oh yeah, she because she asked Leanne, oh, have you had the dreaded lurgy yet? I like the way she said that. Like, I don't and think then, anyone's yeah, ever... My, my husband did. Yeah, my yeah. husband's had everything. Just mild symptoms though, so it's fine. But apart from that, my life is brilliant. I've got, I've got my, my, my son slash daughter, I can't remember, is doing amazingly, going to be a child prodigy. Oh, I've got another baby coming along, like shelling peas. Isn't life great when you're also, a mum, Leanne? my firstborn child can play JD and Believer on the recorder. Yeah, definitely. And does it wearing a nightcap? Mm-hmm. Same with you, Leanne. Yeah, and Leanne Ollie, goes, absolutely. my meta detector's going on. <laughs> um, so Ollie, Leanne, rather than... You know, opening up to this woman that she actually barely knows and hasn't seen for three years um she just she says yeah everything's great I love everything's this cool I love this and then scene. as soon as mandy's out of the way leanne just she has a little ollie wobble of her own doesn't she because you can totally understand it from leanne's point of view you're not going to offload on this woman who's just making chit chat and showing off but Leanne desperately wants those things for herself and she's lied now. And she probably also feels a bit like she's b- betrayed Ollie because it's not his fault that he's not a child prodigy and he's not going... He's not what she not wants to, him to yeah. be. And, and she probably feels guilty for lying about it as well mm. because it's betraying her her son. Mm. Even though it, you know, it's obviously not that, but that's how she feels. And it sounds like what she needs is a bit of counselling from my dear sister Toya, which is exactly right. what she gets on Friday. Who comes round? Leanne offloads onto her and and starts saying, "Oh, I lied about Ollie to this person. What what kind of mum am I?" And Toya says, "Look, look, shut up. It's nothing. It's absolutely normal for you to do what you did to Mandy. Um, don't worry about people thinking that you're gonna." Don't worry people about people thinking that Ollie's different. Who cares what they think? We're, we're the ones that count. We're the ones that know him. Me, she you, Steve, Nick. She made a speech Nick. about all the neighbours as well. Yeah, ev- everyone everybody knows here. how wonderful and special Ollie is. Screw Bandy and anybody else who thinks that he's a bit different. I guess also the other thing was, I don't imagine that, that Leanne would have been up for explaining to Mandy what was wrong with Ollie and having her give her that look of like, oh no, yeah, I'm the so pity. sorry, that's dreadful, anyway, bye, mm, you know. Yeah, yeah. But so, also equally, what are you supposed to say if somebody, you know, this is the sad and tragic thing, isn't it? All, all the kind of basic things that you assume. And like even Leanne says it, like she just takes things for granted and you can't not really, mm. because if you if you didn't take things for granted, you'd just be crippled with anxiety all the time. Yeah. You got to it's got to be a bit of taking happy things for granted. Yeah, so I think I think by the end of this, um, Leanne's feeling a bit less guilty for what she said, and then they, they have a little conversation about the fostering I'll again. I tell you and... what, I really liked that um, Toya told Leanne, and that's it's okay not to be okay. Yes, I think we all need to remind ourselves of that sometimes. Um, Leanne says to Toya, what, "What's going on with your fostering then?" And Toya's like, "Well." 
Well, I still didn't think that it was really the best time to be doing this at the moment. And Leanne says, no, just do it. Get on with it. You're going to make a great one. Which was basically the same as she'd said during that dinner party a couple of weeks ago. So it's just giving this story another kick up the bum. Yeah. To, I mean, I'm still not necessarily expecting to see anything at all from this for a little while. If we do, fine. But um, I'm, it feels I'm like it's of... being put to bed. Uh, I'm confused as to what they can really do with the fostering storyline, considering the restrictions that are going to be put upon them by yeah. social distancing amongst cast members, unless they get a small child to move in with um, Charlie DeMello or George Taylor <laughs> so they can interact with them. Like, um, you can't have a, a little kid coming... A bit of in there. Like a bit from a bit of, um, you know, a, a, a sat... Like, nobody comes... To be a foster kid because they're having a great time with their family. Something terrible has happened in their lives and their parents can't look after them anymore. So what do you do? You have the kid come around. You're like, welcome child, but here's my stick. And if you come anywhere within the circumference, I will beat you with it. Mm. <laughs> you can't have any sort of meaningful, heartfelt, lovely, like, oh, I'm, oh my name's Toya and I'm your new mummy or like. All you can really do is have a moody teenager. Like, so, <laughs> imagine if they adopted, um, what's her faith? Roy's niece. Oh, yeah, Nina. <laughs> imagine if they adopted, I mean, I fostered Nina. Needs, I, I don't think, think she, she would do, but you, I can just, that's the only way it would work. Because they have to socially distance. And it would be kind of funny if they got given a moody teenager who just hated them. <laughs> I think that the, the whole fostering thing was just to, um, you know, have a have a bit of a quandary between like, should I or fair, should I not? But that's it not doesn't, fair on the characters. The story of Toya doesn't and really need it. Um, the, the Toya and Imran needed plot together. Mm. Can't they give them something to do? I suppose the the, the fact that we're not going to see much more of Ollie either because he can't. But you be see on what screen. I mean? They can't. They can't have a little kid. They can't foster a little kid, mm. and and not because there's no reason for them not to to interact. Some characters make sense and you can see the social distancing in a logical way because they're not part of each other's bubbles. But Toya and Imran, Imran are part of each other's bubbles and so should their foster child be. Mm. So how I don't see what they can really do no. with this story for the foreseeable future. No, this is what so I don't why think Yeah, but why write into the script? So, so my dear sister why don't you carry on with your fostering ambition? I don't know, I just think there were a few things in the scripts this week that didn't need to be there. And yeah. They were, and and, and these are, these are still there? the fairly early scripts, aren't they? Yeah, from the post they would have and known, I think a few bits were put in to... Yeah, but they would have known, anyone would have known, writing this script, that there's you can't write a blooming kid into the storyline. Why didn't they write in Toya, I mean, Leanne just saying, look, I totally get where you're coming from. I hope this doesn't cause any problems, but I really do think you're right. And I don't think that I could cope mentally with you having a foster kid because it's going to be really hard for me. It would have made sense. It would have made Leanne look like a bit of a, a bitch. Maybe, yeah, but... Well, do you think that she's that anyway? But you see what I mean? It's the perfect excuse. Toya and Imran were already going, oh, well, Toya was, let's not do this now. And then the script writes it back in for them. <laughs> and right at the moment when they actually cannot do it, they might as well have written they were going to go to Disneyland and just kidnap a child from there. <laughs> let's just go and see which one takes our fancy. We can get them on, we can get them on a, a cruise ship from Florida before anyone notices they're missing. We'll just get to Bermuda and, and sail back to, to England on a boat. And everyone's like, brilliant plan, Toya. That sounds like a DVD special to me. <laughs> I'd buy that. Right, finally, speaking of um, poor children. Oh, who, who's this then? At the siblings. Oh, the siblings. Still not gone to Australia. I suppose they can't oh, at I the like moment. This. this was kind of sweet. So, I, I enjoyed this so on Monday. So this was on Monday. Abby comes into the pub and Jenny's there and they start talking about the twins. And then Gemma comes in and she immediately starts yabbering on about... Oh, you, you, your twins are going to live in Australia. Oh my God, I don't know how you could do, let that happen. I would never let my twins be taken away from me. Quads. I would, quads, I would die before that happened. Oh my God, blah, blah, blah. She blah, doesn't realise that what she's saying is, you know, 
completely the wrong thing, does she? She, Abby, she? she doesn't say it to be mean or anything. No, she it's just, just literally the, is just, just carried says away. says the first thing that comes into her head. Carried away with the fact that her entire life revolves around four plastic dolls. Abby feels very awful about this and she sort of makes zero excuses and leaves. And then this is when um, Jenny gives Gemma like a glare like you idiot how could you be so insensitive and Gemma's like (laughs) whoops have I done it again so she then finds Abby outside the chippy and she's like look I'm really sorry I I didn't think about it and Abby says I still think about twins all all the time but this is my chance to make up for my my mistakes and then she says I spent my whole life being selfish and now I have to do something good for them that was a really nice quote and then they both sit on opposite benches and they have a socially distanced cuddle and they kind of hold their hands up and it could have been really crap with the wrong people doing this but I think it worked it worked really it's... well because they were both characters that would do this and also yeah. they're both really good actresses when you give them good lines well I think that that's that stuff like this is more that they need to be uh, giving Gemma yeah. not gross out stuff not stuff where she's just going on about you know being an idiot or not just stuff about the quads I thought that that was a nice little character moment for the two of them yes oh, yeah. lovely uh, I, 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 I suppose this particular story was another one that wasn't needed there, there wasn't any development particularly well, it, wasn't, it was just no, there it was, was reminding because, us that, that no because Abby decided because because we've learned we also learned that they're not going they're still not going yet mm. it's, it's still making preparations to leave so it wasn't like Abby had a final chance to say goodbye and she blew it and now they're in Australia they're still in the country so we've established that we've also now established that that she decided that she wants to say goodbye to them which I was all for previously, but now I'm thinking to myself, but what, but what is the purpose of this now? It makes sense narratively, I guess, but... Did she decide that, that she just wanted to say goodbye to them? She said, I've spent my whole life being selfish and now I have to do something good for them. And no, I, think, I, thought, I thought that she was just talking about letting them go. Do you reckon? It's something good for them. I don't yeah. agree with her. I think she's being an idiot. <laughs> don't you think The whole thing's turned on its head now. Yeah, but don't you think that saying goodbye to your kids... She thinks she's being I good. I think if she doesn't, not. she'll end up regretting it. Well, I, you know, um, I have. I'm not sure whether we're little, actually going to see it. I have very little um, interest, particularly in her seeing them now. It's been too long, I think, mm. for me to really care. Yeah. Well, it feels like that if they need to, that they can um, put the story to bed now. But then it was. I don't know. It was already. Yeah. Anyway. It's already in bed. As, as was it was already in bed, and they woke up and got out of bed and went, You all right? You're sleeping well? And it went, Yeah, I'm fine, thanks, and went back to bed again. <laughs> right, how many, what are you giving this week? Not a high number. No, no, normally I feel like a bit of a downer because, like last week, I gave it a three, but it seemed like everyone in the Facebook group enjoyed it a whole lot more than I did. But still, this week, I, again, I think that last week, oh, good Shut old up. motorbike outside there, isn't there? Last week, like this week, I think Monday was better, and then the Wednesday and Friday episodes just didn't didn't grab me as much. I really enjoyed the stuff on Monday with Elaine. I mean, Elaine is just fantastic. Um, all the stuff with her being menaced at the ginnel, um, the, <laughs> the the fact that it was end, ended on a bit of a mystery. And yeah, I know they were trying to solve the mystery on Wednesday and Friday, but I don't know, it just didn't. I don't know, it just didn't quite do it for me. Um, and the the stuff with Gary and Adam and Sarah, I. It was more exciting on Monday, and I, and when she, was it Monday when she was lying to the police and everything? I can't, maybe it it just it felt like it was it meandered a little bit after that. Um, I did really enjoy the Abby and Gemma stuff. Um, I thought the the Leanne and Toya stuff was fine, if a little unnecessary, maybe. Um, I might go three again. Yeah, I'd give three, it three. Three um, mint yo-yos. Right, so when five. Toya said mint yo-yos, did she mean that they were mint coloured or did she mean they were mint as in really good? No, it's a chocolate snack. Yo-yo? Yes. Made of mint? No, it's not an actual yo-yo. It's just a round thing like a Viscount or a, what, a small a wagon Viscount? wheel. A mint yo-yo? It's just like a round biscuity thing, I think. It's a biscuit called a yo-yo. Yeah, they don't do them anymore. 
No, they don't. They're around. Wonder why. They're around back when Toya and Leanne were little. Because people like me went to the shop and went, a mint yo-yo? Why well, does one They probably this? had orange ones as well. A mint yo-yo? That's what I'm giving it. Three mint yo-yos out of five. What are you giving it? Three socially distanced cuddles. Ah. Ah. Um, I am going to Who give my character of the week this Do day. I give this to? Um, Very tricky because... There weren't very many storylines. I felt like nothing of it. There's, there's been, there's been this week and last week where there's been a seriously reduced number of stories. Like last week, it was the Gary thing, the the Jeff thing, and Bailey's, and now this week it was Gary, Jeff, and you know, a bit of Abby, bit of bit of Leanne. Can't give it to Gary because he's a scoundrel. I mean, Adam was fun this week. Sarah was fun, but I don't think they deserve to be character of the week. There's no award for being bad at lying. Is it is it is it Alia? Is it Sally? Is it is it Tim for maybe um for starting to believe his dad but then he doesn't by the end of it, but I don't know. Is it is it Jeff for just being dastardly and enjoyable to watch? Um Oh god. I think I think out of all the characters that I enjoyed watching the most, it's Elaine again. Just <laughs> just for the great performance and um uh, and her scenes I was most invested in. So I, I think I think I'm gonna go for for Elaine. Making me yeah, making me intrigued the most. Oh, I don't know who to give it to. She wasn't even in it for half the week. I know. Well convince me otherwise. I'm not it's not my business. Oh, I don't know who to pick who to pick. Sally. <laughs> go for it, you pick Sally. Yeah. Fine. 